Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to the Science of Kabbalah with your hosts, Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson and William Hall, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Here we are again on the Science of Kabbalah here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. This is Rabbi Yitzchak. And this is William Hall. Rabbi, how are you today? I Despite am... all of the chaos. Chaos. Well, yes. it depends on what you look at, what you gaze at, and what you peer at. How I answer that question. And what stage you walked into the conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, it really depends on... What I'm talking about is the idea of, like, what are you looking at? Are you spending your days on social media? Do you read the newspapers? Are you on uh, Fox News, for those of you in the U.S., or Israel um, National News, Arut Sheva here in Israel, just looking at everything that's going on? And, And is that where you're getting your understanding on what's going on in the world? And how the world works. Mm-hmm. Right. I hear you. You know, you brought in uh, to the show on Tanakh Talk, um, Parshat Shalach, or Shalach mm-hmm. Lecha. Yes. Uh, and the last half of the show, I think we did, you, you mentioned uh, the idea of the Azizit. Uh, mm-hmm. The fringes of Azizit. Right. And um, uh, I like what you, you and I were talking earlier before the show. And I'm only saying it now because I don't want you to forget because I want you to hear – I want to hear more about it. Mm-hmm. Um, how the Zitziot, you know, the, the the whole commandment is to look down upon them and to remember to keep the commandments and stuff, right? So – and as you connected that with uh, having something to connect to to remind you to think properly. Don't get, don't get caught up in these worldly things. Focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so everything that I've been talking about for the last several weeks and what we've been talking about is the idea of me trying to refocus people's attention, at least people that claim to have a relationship with Hashem and people who are following Torah, to refocus them, to say, look, this is what, uh, to say, look, this is the way Hashem created the universe. He created it in a way and gave us instructions. He gave us a constitution, if you will, and the constitution constitution that he gave us is far different than the constitution the inalienable rights that people think that they have in the u.s are totally different than the rights and the responsibilities and the obligations that hashem gave us in the torah so that's what i want to focus on a little bit today and bring in from shalach lecha the idea of tzitzit and see if we can find some connections to refocus for all of us to refocus so stay with us we're going to be right back here on the science of kabbalah after a short break israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world israel is an island of stability in a sea of war and unrest in the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to the Science of Kabbalah with your host, Rabbi Yitzchak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back, folks. It's only been a minute or two, but it feels like forever. Hey, look at <laughs> this week. Zit seat. I want to hear it, Rob. That's, that's all I've been thinking about lately. I saw a video today um, on Facebook, and it was about a three-minute video. And it was this black guy uh, who was had a graduation uniform on. Um, he was really, really huge guy, football player, mm-hmm. lineman, I think. And he gave the most amazing speech. I mean, it was a tear jerk. I was like, wow, that was talking about a motivational speaker. That was the best thing I'd ever heard. But then uh, after about a minute and a half, he started getting into uh, his, his spiritual side of that. And I was like, yeah, I'm not interested. <laughs> mm-hmm. But but the thing was, uh, everything that was mentioned in that thing are things that, that really just hit home like man this you should be thinking about this and thinking about this so how appropriately you're bringing this in and tying it all together with this week's parsha yeah so 
The Parsha of Shalach Lecha, as most Parshiot in the Torah are very famous. I mean, obviously, most people think about Shalach Lecha. They think about the spies, spies that go into the land that Moshe sends. Hashem says, Shalach Lecha, send for yourself. And we know that uh, 10 of them come back and give a bad report. Um, and that Lashon Hara is not just when you're talking about people. It can be about things as well, like the land. And this is one of the things that the, the spies did. But... What we're talking about is the end of the Parsha, and and it's interesting, we always talk about how there seems to be, um, we'll see sections in the Torah that seem to be out of place. So like just before we see the mitzvah of tzitzit, we see the story of the person who's gathering sticks on Shabbat. And we can go into a whole thing on that. It turns out that if you study the Gemara, you find out that there's an opinion that this is Tzalaf Chad. Tzalaf Chad, who was, whose daughters came to Moshe Rabbeinu when they came to the land of Israel and all of the tribes were receiving their portion in the land. And Tzalaf Chad's daughters came and said, well, what about us? Our father died in the wilderness and he didn't have any sons. They wanted to know whether or not they would get a portion. And of course, Moshe had to go to Hashem and Hashem said, yes, they they can receive a portion. But it's really about the idea of Tzalafchad being identified in the Talmud and in other sources with being the person who sinned and gathered the sticks. And there's a whole story about this. There's a beautiful story about Salafchad, but the reason I bring it up is because there are opinions that bring the, the bring down the notion that the reason why Salafchad, the story of Salafchad is there, is to make the connection with the importance of the observance of Shabbat. Mm-hmm. And then bringing in this idea of the mitzvah of the tzitzit, which becomes now a visual for us as a reminder to keep all of the mitzvot. And what we learn is that Chazal teach, and may get into a little bit further and deeper into this, is the idea that within the concept of Shabbat is contained all of the mitzvot and the other thing that the, the sages teach that also combines or contains all of the mitzvot in it as well is the idea of tzitzit. And so we see that in in the end of Parsha Shalach Lecha in Numbers chapter 15, verse 37 through 41. If somebody wants to read that, that's where we have the mitzvah of tzitzit. Uh, where it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and tell them to make tzitzit, these fringes for themselves on the corners of their garments for all generations, and to add a string of tchelet, that is uh, the the sky blue uh, string to the tzitzit of each corner. This will be your tzitzit and you shall gaze at it Remember, we talked about gazing or looking or peering and thereby remember. And it's this idea of remembrance is this idea of kind of having a consciousness, maintaining the consciousness of the commandments. And and as a result, it will stop you from going astray after basically the 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 di- desires and the lusts of your eyes, so to speak. Um, okay. And and then it you. says, OK, just and, and then it says so that you will remember and fulfill all my commandments and thus become sanctified to Hashem. I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. In order to be your God, I am Hashem, your God. So I can see how wearing tzitzit would be a time-sensitive commandment. I get that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I don't understand necessarily is um, I've I've spoken with a lot of uh, a lot of not 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 sure. I haven't spoken with a lot of Jewish people. I've known Mm -hmm. I've known a few Jewish people who uh, they'll actually tuck their uh, their talit katan, they'll actually tuck it in their pants where you can't see them mm-hmm. for whatever reason. I'm like, isn't that like you're not really fulfilling the commandment because you're supposed to be able to look down and see them? So there can be an argument for for both ways. One would be 
the idea when you when you talk about seat seat, one of the things you have to realize is that it's it, it's kind of we talked a little bit about this yesterday in the idea that let's say you talk about something that's another outward mitzvah that we do that's time sensitive as well, like tefillin, the idea right. of wearing the, the shel yad, the tefillin on your arm and tefillin, tefillin on your head. The thing is that tefillin is separate in and of itself, meaning that it's, although we wear it on our body, it's not connected to our clothing. Whereas tzitzit, in order to fulfill that mitzvah, it's really connected to a garment. Now, when you when you talk about the idea of garments, then you have to discuss what what is the purpose of clothing, whether it was we're talking about the culture and society of the time when the mitzvah was given. Our clothing might be different today, but what is really clothing about? You can go all the way back to the very beginning and talk about Adam and Chava in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden, and the fact that it wasn't until they ate from the Eitz Hada'at, until they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they did not know that they were naked. They didn't know that nakedness was something that was bad. And it was only then that then they covered themselves. And then we have this idea of clothing. So what am I getting at? I'm getting at the point that in a way, you can make the argument, and an argument is made by Chazal and many of the sources, that tzitzit, being connected to our garments, also is related to protecting us from those things that are sexual in nature, to protect us from those sexual sins. And so when you start talking about the idea of tucking them in or leaving them out, certainly if you tuck them in, an argument could be made that by having the seat seat tucked in, you kind of feel it on you. You can feel the seat seat, the fringes on your leg, so to speak. And let's say you were going to go to now I'm going to give you an example. I'm not going to mention somebody's name, but I happen to know somebody that years ago came to me and said to me that they knew a particular individual who used to wear a seat seat and got caught up in an illicit situation. And he knew, he knew that this person had succumbed to that illicit relationship. And how did he know? He said, because the guy stopped wearing tzitzit. And when he confronted the individual, his suspicions were confirmed. And the guy said, I had to take the tzitzit off because literally every time I opened up my pants and took my pants down, obviously to do something that was against Torah, he would see the tzitzit. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't deal with seeing them. And so he had to take them off and stopped wearing them completely. So, so an argument can be made for both that, yes, we're told that to, to see it. And, and one of the, th one of the opinions is that it wasn't just about us seeing it was, but it was about others. Yeah. Uh, you know, our brothers, another Jew coming along and seeing our seat seat as well. And knowing that we were also people that were keeping the Torah. Isn't that how the actual Hebrew is read anyway? Yes. That, that, so that they will look down or yes. will then see what you're wearing. But also to, to go a, kind of a, to, I guess you could say, add to what you were saying, though, if the guy who had this problem with the illicit behavior had been wearing them on the outside, perhaps he would have never gotten so deep into the point where he had to wait until he, you know, removed his britches before he saw them to begin. No, that's, so, it, it, it's yeah. definitely that's definitely an argument that could be made as well. I happen to be an Audi. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not an any, I'm an Audi. And and I see that and I wonder about it myself sometimes. I, I thought to myself, you know, one day I should go out and do a uh, a poll and ask, um, right. you know, because we have a very diverse community here in Svat. We have everything from ultra orthodox to um, I wouldn't say that we have uh, liberal liberal. Um, I, I don't even know if we have people that would identify as reform or conservative. Typically, it's Svat tends to be sort of a religious community for the most part. So, but I would say that you have anything from Haredim that are ultra orthodox people that are really strict to people that are just conservative consider themselves modern Orthodox. And I see it across the board. I see those people that wear their tzitzit out, and I see those that 
um, look Haredi and and yet wear their tzitzit in. So uh, it, it's an interesting thing. I, I may have to start doing that poll so that we can answer that question. I think you'd be asking for trouble if you do a poll on that. <laughs> <laughs> look, the only, the only opportunity that I have to vent currently is this radio show. That's, I even, that's interesting. I even try to behave myself on Tanakh Talk. But it's like I told a friend earlier that these things that are pet peeves of mine related to what I see people doing and people saying and this idea of trying to refocus people that the only time that I really get to say what I want to say without the fear of somebody coming back and people may come back is doing my radio show doing the radio show with you so um, anyway we're going to have to go to a break and we're going to talk more about CC and this idea of what you should be looking at when we come back after a short break here on the Science of Kabbalah and IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com The Tamar Yona Show Tamar? She's sassy She's smart She's funny But she's also a real Jewish mother Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Science of Kabbalah here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. This is Rabbi Yitzhak along with my amazing co-host, William Hall. Thank you, sir. You're very kind. No, I'm not. It's true. You're a great co-host. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you're a great host. So, hey, thank what do we say? Thank the you. dynamic duo, there just like uh, Leah and uh, Julie. <laughs> I could not imagine finding any anybody to match a better pair than both of them. That's for sure. Besides us, of course. Of besides course, of course. us, yeah. Besides us. <laughs> yeah. So, so, in going back to this idea of the seat seat, so the we just said that the what I read from thirty seven through forty one. One of the things that the Torah says is that you should gaze at the seat seat. And it's interesting that the word tzitzit actually comes from the root to mean to peer or to gaze. We actually see this in Shir Hashirim in Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, it says in English, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young deer. Behold, he was near the entire time standing behind our wall standing behind our wall, supervising from the windows, peering, and the word is mitzitz, through the lattices. And that word is the same root, that idea of tzitz, really has this idea of to look or to peer. And so when you think about this whole concept behind the tzitzit, and that we wear on, you mentioned that, like the talit katan, which is the, the garment that we wear. Some people wear it on the outside, not just the fringes, but for instance, in the neighborhood where I live, which is very close to Breslov, some people at a Breslov wear that seat seat over their shirt as opposed to under their shirt. Then you have the people that wear the fringes out and the people that wear the fringes in. But you also have the talit gadol, which is the larger talit that we wear when we're doing tefillot. When, uh, when people daven. Really, the seat seat strings, when you're talking about it being related to looking, to peering, to gazing, it really connects us, and I talked about this idea of having consciousness, it really connects us to the providence of Hashem. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's understanding that the world... And the universe, we talked at the beginning in the intro, this idea that Hashem created the world, created the universe in a certain way, and gave us instructions. So it's the idea that there's a constant supervision or an overseeing everything that happens. So that when you look at that verse that we just mentioned in Shea Hashirim in Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 9, and this idea of the beloved peering 
through the lattices or through the window, you can say that this is talking about Hashem, that he is the one who is peering deeply into our souls through the lattices of this world. And so what's the response to that? The response to that is when we do the same thing back, when we reciprocate and we look at the tzitzit, this is how we remember the fact that Hashem loves us, the fact that Hashem is in charge, the fact that there is this providence, that there's this constant supervision that goes on where he's always there, he's ever seeing with everything that happens. And I mean, I don't know what to say. I can't imagine that he, you know, we have a verse in in the Bible that says that Hashem sits in the heaven and he laughs. I don't think he's laughing right now. I, I think now we, we don't anthropomorphize God. We We certainly believe that he feels, in a sense, these things are more for us. So when I say he laughs, he, he, we know that Hashem is not an entity that has a form that he physically laughs the way we understand laughing. If, if I told you a joke and you laughed. So the same thing with crying. But I believe he's crying. I believe that we are not living. The world is not living, certainly with all the chaos that's going on. I mean, it's crazy. I just read an article before I came on with you where they defaced the sign in Liverpool, England, that commemorates Penny Lane, the famous Beatles song, because somebody thinks that it's named after a guy that was a slave trader back in the 1700s. Now, I'm not suggesting that slave trading is disgusting. It's terrible. And we see that even Hashem talks in the Torah about the proper way to take care of slaves. And the only reason we see that in the Torah is because Hashem always knew that because we were surrounded by pagan cultures that did these things, that there was the possibility that we were going to stray from the proper way to live and the proper way to treat each other. And so he wanted to make sure that if you were going to do this, that you did it in a proper way. So, so it's this idea that going back to this idea of providence and using the tzitzit as that sign. Now, I'm suggesting today, because I'm not saying that I know everybody out there wears tzitzit, and I'm not even suggesting that somebody wear tzitzit if they're not Jewish. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is that there has to be a way that even if you don't physically wear tzitzit, that there is something that you do, there's something that you can, I don't know, you put a token in your pocket, do something that you set aside that's going to be that thing that you recognize as the connection between you and Hashem that's going to remind you of what your obligations and what your responsibilities are. We don't all have the same ones. I have 613 obligations and you have less than that. Uh, but but that doesn't mean that you can't take on something uh, that you can carry, something that you can look at that is going to be that reminder for you to refocus. That's what I'm suggesting that people do today. Right. Uh, you know, when I was in elementary school one time, I mm-hmm. remember we had um, a special day where everybody was supposed to wear a tie for something. It wasn't photographs. It was something else. Mm-hmm. And so the teacher had told us uh, the day before she had passed out these little these little threads, uh, little pieces of thread, and handed it to each of the students. Told them to tie it around your pinky finger and just leave it there until tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And that was your reminder to not forget to wear your tie. And it worked, you know. So it's uh, it's it would be nice to know that there was something creative that would be permissible for non Jew to do on their own uh, that they could create for themselves to make a reminder, you know. Uh, but I think the uh, the ruling opinion is they shouldn't add to or take away. Um, I'm not sure how that works out, but it seems like there should be a happy medium somewhere for that. Right. And, and all I'm saying is that it doesn't have to be that it doesn't have to be that the non-Jewish person who identifies as a Ben or Bad Noach or however they identify need to have one set thing that they all identify with, because we don't want to start a new religion. We don't want to add something to the, the responsibilities and obligations that Hashem didn't give us. 
But that doesn't mean that you don't have something that's important to you that could be a reminder. Uh, that's all I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting that people should go out and and do the seat seat because the truth is that I've had people come to me and ask me about it, like people that are just starting their journey and, and maybe starting to become religious and will ask me about tzitzit, will ask me about techelet and the different opinions. And, and the first thing that I ask them is why? Why do you want to take on the mitzvah? I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't because right. they should. But I always ask the question why? Because if the, if the reason why you're taking on a mitzvah is to look Jewish, then uh, maybe other rabbis would argue and say, well, it's the start. You know, they're doing it lo lishma, not for the sake of heaven, and that eventually they'll do it lishma for the sake of heaven. But for me, I think there needs to be a why. If you just want to look Jewish, then there could potentially be a problem because then you're wearing tzitzit and you're saying to the rest of the world that you're a religious Jew. And then if that person that maybe is on a journey towards that sees you doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. Let they, let's let say they see you with tzitzit, but then you, they see you violating Shabbat. They see you lighting a cigarette on Shabbat or they see you driving on Shabbat and then they see you get out of the car with tzitzit. Then it becomes right. more of a thing that why did you really do it? Was it just to look Jewish or was it really as part of a journey towards becoming closer to Hashem and what he's saying in those verses, which is to remember my mitzvot, which we said combines all of them together. Right, right. So one, one idea could be for, if it's for a non-Jew is, because most guys that I know wear watches, they could buy a special, you know, watch band that maybe it's got some Hebrew writing on it or something. Or, uh, you yeah, know, well, you just, bracelet. Did, yeah, bracelet. There you go. You gets, know, gets, necklace, you know, it's got. Get some kind of bracelet that has um, some kind of Hebrew inscription on it or something that's going to, that's going to remind you. Uh, that every time you look at it, I mean, look, the Christians do that. They don't, they have their like WWJD. Right. What would the uh, little Joe do? Right. Um, <laughs> he wouldn't have done that. I'll tell you. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. <I'm just> <laughs> yeah. So there's a very, there's another very interesting uh, connection that I want to bring in because it also talked about Techelet. Techelet being the blue string, and there are different opinions about w whether that translates blue or not. Uh, there are some things that we can say about that, about techelet, and the idea of tachlit, the word tachlit, which many people uh, say tachlis. You'll hear the Ashkenazim, and, the, and that word has changed from what the actual Hebrew of tachlit means. And I'll leave you with this before we go to break. Tachlit, in its literal translation in the Hebrew, actually means purpose. It has to do with purpose. And it has to do with the idea of purpose as it relates to aim. Not aim in the sense of aiming at a target, although you, you could say that, but aim in the sense of what, what are you aiming towards? What's your purpose? Hold that thought. And we're going to talk more about Tachlit and Tachlit when we come back here on the Science of Kabbalah after a short break. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Political Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzchak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. All right, welcome back to our final segment of the Science of Kabbalah here on Israel News Talk Radio. So you've all got a great 
big dose of Zitziot fringes and a bunch of different aspects of it this week, which is good. Uh, this is something I wouldn't mind actually doing on the show myself, just do a whole show just on fringes by itself, you mm. know, with no other ex- other additions or anything. So uh, I'm learning a lot. You know, I think it's kind of cool because um, before, whenever I had talked with, um, you know, just random people, not random people, random rabbis over the past uh, like seven years or so, in previous times, um, it was just the idea that an Anju couldn't wear seat seat, so don't even think about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they never offered a solution, and so what you and I just discussed in the last spang- segment was there is a solution. You know, you you, you can't wear seat seat, but you can do something else. Get you a necklace. You know, you can. A lot of guys like to wear hats. They can get a, a nice hat that they that they can see. You know, when they look in the mirror, or get a necklace, bracelet, do something with your watch. You know, something that you can have as your own personal ri- reminder. But the key is, like you said, don't make it like a rule for everybody else in the Noahide community because then you are creating a new law, technically speaking. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my only concern. And I, I want to be clear on that, that, that I'm not suggesting that. I'm just right. saying that you find something that works for you that's going to refocus you that when you get up in the morning and you already know that you're bothered by the fact that you're going to open up Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, and you're going to be bothered by what you're reading, or you're going to be bothered by the fact that uh, you have friends that don't believe that you have uh, an opinion that's worth bringing, which, by the way, I should I should mention now on this subject since um, we – we didn't mention it here on the show, but I, I was talking to you about this off the air. When you're talking about Judaism in general, we, we talk often about the Talmud, and I bring up references to the Talmud all the time, you know, which is a basis for a lot of the law that we have, the, the halakha that we have in Judaism, that the whole style of, of the, the Talmud, uh, at least the Gemara, which is the commentary on the Mishnah, on the law, is set up in an argumentative style where the rabbis are arguing with each other. Now, they have great respect for each other, but they argue with each other, bringing opinions from all different extremes back and forth. So people need to understand that within Judaism, the idea of spirited debate is foundational to who we are and the sources that are brought. So for people to, for anybody, out there who's listening, and even if you're not listening, if you listen to this in the archive, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you have an opinion, and let's say your opinion is liberal and you don't like the the person who's coming with a conservative opinion, you don't have a right to silence that person. The, The whole basis of our religion and what our sages brought was argumentation, but in a very respectful way. So I don't think either one conservatives don't have a right to silence liberals and liberals certainly don't have the right to silence um, the conservatives and nobody has a right to be hurtful towards another person and nobody should unfriend anybody or block anybody simply because they have different opinions about um, the way the world should work because at the end of the day what I'm trying to bring us is to focus back it's not about peering and gazing and looking at the tzitzit. It's peering and gazing and looking at the tzitzit or whatever it is that you're using in order to drive you back to the Torah. The Torah is what we follow. So it doesn't matter what your opinions are on politics, whether you're liberal, conservative, libertarian, whether you're, uh, you follow Likud or whether you follow blue and white here in Israel, whatever it is, that, none of that matters. The only thing that matters are the instructions that Hashem gave us. That's tachlit. That's the purpose. That's the aim that I was talking about. Now, tachlis today, you know, means something completely different. People see it, uh, you know, more of uh, it almost uh, can can mean in today's language this idea of actually or something being true or whatever. But tachlit, even if you look at the uh, Tanakh, um, Eov in the book of Eov in chapter 26, I think it's in verse 10, it uses that word tachlit and it's speaking about it as it relates to the way Hashem created the universe in that verse and it talks about it being to the to the boundary. Um, it's back to that idea of aim because it's speaking about the boundary, speaking about almost like the boundary to the ends of the earth when we use an expression like that. 
So I just think there's an interesting connection when we're talking about techelet and tachlit, that it's so close that when we're talking about tzitzit, it really is trying to refocus us on this idea of aim or purpose. What is your purpose? What is your aim? And this idea of techelet, which is very close in language as well. And then when we talk about the color, really, Chazal, they kind of capitalize on, on the double meaning of techelet, which they say in Sota, in, in the Gemara of Sota 17a, where it says that techelet resembles the ocean, the ocean resembles the sky, and the sky resembles the throne of glory, the Kisei HaKavod. So they connect this idea of that that particular shade or color of blue related to the ocean, related to the sky, Shamayim, the heavens, and to the Kisei HaKavod. If they were just referring to the color blue, then this third illusion wouldn't make any sense. But instead, the blue of the Techelet is really reminding us to raise our sights beyond this world. That, that if we really truly want to grasp and connect with our aim, with that tachlit, with that purpose, going to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the boundary, which is to become a kisei hakavod, in, in a sense, the same way that we want to be a mishkan, in a sense, I'm saying not literally, but in a sense, being a kisei, kisei hakavod, a throne of glory for Hashem. Right. So in other words, the, that blue, that techelet, is supposed to point to a higher tachlit, to a higher purpose, to a higher aim in life. And that's what I'm saying. We should not close our eyes. I'm not suggesting that people close their eyes and be blind to the terrible things that are going on in the world today, to the chaos. You mentioned it being chaos. And it is not so much here in Israel. We're not... We don't see so much of that here. But in other parts of the world, and certainly in the U.S., it's chaotic. There's no question. And I'm not suggesting that people... Lawless, chaotic. Lawless and chaotic. And I'm not suggesting that people be blind to it, but you can respond to it rather than reacting to it. And responding to it is to say to yourself, you know, what am I really about? What is my aim? What is my purpose? Who am I really connected to? One of the things that Kabbalah teaches us is that this world is called Alma de Shikra. It's called the world of lies. It's also called a world of illusion. That's one of the reasons why when I first got into radio, I called my original show Beyond the Matrix. Because in a way, Kabbalah teaches that this world is basically like that movie, The Matrix. That what we see we can touch and we can feel you're sitting at a desk in the studio. I'm sitting at a desk in my studio and I can feel my desk and it's real and it's, and it, it's got form to it. But the Kabbalah teaches that all this is, is a spark of creation that really it's just an illusion. So that when you're looking at those things and you're connecting to those things that are out there that are chaotic and you're not looking past this, you're not looking at the tzitzit, you're not looking at the, the tachlit, you're not looking at the techelet, you're not looking at this higher purpose, this higher aim. I mean, this is why Shabbat is also called tachlit shemayim va'aretz. Tachlit shemayim va'aretz, the purpose and goal for which heaven and earth were created. So when we're talking about this idea that within tzitzit, is combined all of the mitzvot and and that within also Shabbat, the mitzvah of Shabbat is combined all the mitzvot. Then you can understand why Shabbat is called Tachlit Shemayim Va'aretz, the purpose and goal for which heaven and earth were created. Because what is the, the aim and purpose for us as a people? The aim and purpose for us is to see everything to return back to the world in which it was created. Everything from the beginning, when Hashem created this world, was to place man and when he created woman in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden. And if you really study the Torah, you'll find 
that the progression that we see from Gan Eden through the destruction of the days of Noah to, to reestablishing the earth, to bringing about the Mishkan, to bringing the people into Eretz Canaan, to give them the land of Israel, everything has been about this concept of tikkun, repair, in order to bring this world back to a place in which Hashem can once again live amongst men. Build me a Mishkan so I may dwell in them. This is his intention that we bring this world back to the Garden of Eden. And what is going to be ultimately the end? The ultimate end is that we're going to have the great Shabbat. If the aim and purpose of Shabbat is the purpose and goal for which heaven and earth were created, then it goes back to that very purpose that ultimately all of us are waiting for that day for the real for the true for the real jewish messiah that's going to come that's going to usher in the great shabbat where we will live on this earth not going to some other place where this earth will be repaired and where we will ultimately live in an ultimate not just a bubble of time of 25 or 26 hours but in a Shabbat that's eternal. That's got to be our aim and our purpose. That's what we need to do when we look at the tzitzit or whatever it is that you choose to use. Awesome. Good show, Rabbi. As usual, yeah, thank you. Thank you for everybody for listening. Stay with us every week, every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Israel time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here on the Science of Kabbalah on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Torres from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.